To lose the man. 
to hand over to Sue as she reads our prayers of adoration, confession and thanksgiving. Father, we gather here today, today, expecting to meet with you. Holy Spirit, come, rest among us, that we might hear God's voice and see his power, that we might be aware of God's presence here in this place and see a glimpse of his glory. For we are God's people, chosen and marked by love. We rejoice to share in God's family name and delight to be created for glory. Our names were chosen in baptism and reveal our pasts and the families we have come from. Our names define who we are and like Jesus, we are children of the God who chose to call us sons or daughters. We are beloved and precious to God. May we live knowing above all that God created and named us. In baptism, we are baptized by water and the spirit and released into the fullness of life. And all we have and all we are, we offer to you in praise and worship of God. We stand bathed in your grace and are truly blessed. A prayer of confession. Lord God, in your grace and mercy, you have called us to be your children. We confess that we may not be living in the true freedom that you offer to those who have been baptised. Forgive us in those times when we've not listened to your voice or responded to your call of love. When instead we've listened to the voices of temptation and allowed ourselves to stray from your path. We acknowledge that we are often overwhelmed by guilt and envy, anger and greed. God of justice, hear our prayers for mercy for we know when we are truly sorry, the words of Jesus resonate. Go and sin no more. And in these words, we have the blessed assurance of forgiveness. Thanks be to God. And we thank God. God, we thank you for John the Baptist, a wild man of the wilderness, who calls us to immerse ourselves in transforming water. We thank you for Jesus, the carpenter and preacher, who in humility knelt before John and submitted to the welcome of baptismal water. For Jesus, who lived among us as a man and then gave his life to redeem us. In gladness and thankfulness, we recognize that the whole of our lives are bound in the mystery of faith, this day and every day and that you, God, will continue to lead us in faith and hope. Amen. Thank you, Susan. We're now going to have our reading from Isaiah. I think Christine's going to do that. Isaiah 43, verses 1 through to 7. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 7. Israel's only saviour. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O, o Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, 
they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honoured in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you, and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Thanks be to God. We may all experience tough times during our life's journeys, and such times can be hard, exhausting, and wearing. This passage in Isaiah is written when the Jewish people were in exile in Babylon. It was a real time of challenge for them. There would be no doubt that the Jewish people felt abandoned by God, and maybe even felt like giving up on their covenant their covenant promise with God, which they made many years before when times were good. And I'm sure in the established church today, we feel like the minority, feel like the church is in some kind of exile, especially during the lockdowns of the last few years. Many in the established church today feel that with all this political correctness and encompassing such diverse culture and religious things that Christianity is being pushed to the margins. Many feel that all the secularism around us is pushing aside those important Christian festivals like Christmas and Easter and they're being taken over by consumerism. And we might even feel that after the impact of COVID and the numbers attending church going down year on year, that there is no hope. And so that message of Isaiah is not only giving hope to the people of, of God in Babylon, those words are still relevant to God's people here today. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. So whatever we might be feeling right now, one thing is for sure, and that is that God has not given up on us, given up on us individually, as corporately as the church, because we are the people of God. So let us turn to God again and sing with all our hearts that most wonderful hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart.
in that version for many years. It brought back many happy memories. And we're going to have a reading now from Luke's Gospel. Wendy's going to read from Luke chapter 3. Thanks, Wendy. Luke chapter 3, verses 15 to 17 and 21 to 22. People's hopes began to rise, and they began to wonder whether John, perhaps, might be the Messiah. So John said to them all, I baptise you with water, but someone is coming who is much greater than I am. I'm not good enough even to untie his sandals. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He has his winnowing shovel with him to thresh out all the grain, but he will burn the chaff in, the, in a fire that never goes out. After all the people had been baptised, Jesus was also baptised. While he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit came down upon him in bodily form like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my own dear son, I am pleased with you. Thanks be to God for his holy words. Thanks, Wendy. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, for the Bible, for all that it can mean to us today, but it truly is the living word of God. And so as we come together to worship and praise you, we thank you for your Holy Spirit moving amongst us. So open our minds, our hearts and our ears, that we may hear afresh your message for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's funny, isn't it, that we never really appreciate just how tired we are until we stop. I wonder how many of us have looked forward to holidays or just time off, time away, and when it finally comes to it, we spend those first few days catching up with our sleep. Christmas Day and Boxing Day were wonderful this year. I was able, like many, to spend time with all my boys and their families. And then on Boxing Day evening, I drove back to Bolton uh, with my youngest son, James, and around 10 o'clock, we went to bed. We were shattered. I took the dog up with me, and off to sleep we went. We didn't wake up till half past eight, or I didn't wake up till half past eight. And I went to the bathroom, and I saw the dog was still asleep, so I thought, ah, oh, I'll have another 10 minutes. And I didn't wake up till 10 o'clock. So... Despite 12 hours sleep, I still felt tired. And I did the same the next night, another 12 hours sleep. But you'll be pleased to know that I'm back on track. Normal eight hours now, normal services resumed. <laughs> I'm refreshed and I'm firing on all cylinders. And so the theme for today is being resourced by God. Resourced through a little R and R. And I don't mean rest and renewal although that is good too. Our reading from Isaiah reminds us that we should never, never give up on hope, especially where God is concerned. After all, God has not given up on any of us, despite changes and challenges that we are seeing in the established church today. So we need that R and R. And the first R is for resilience. And we certainly need to be resilient people of God. We, like the Jewish people in exile, we need to stay resilient. And to stay resilient is through our second R, refocusing. In our reading from Luke's Gospel, we hear that familiar story of Jesus' baptism alongside those terrifying words of the chaff that would be burnt up with unquenchable fire. I'm not sure about you or your core beliefs, 
But for me, I do struggle with such verses. It takes me right back to childhood and those men that walk round the village with the sandwich boards on, you know, the end is nigh and your sins will find you out. And then also on the occasions when I would hit my younger sister or pinch her and then I'd run off and fall over and my mum would say, Deborah, that's God paying you back. John proclaims a gospel of repentance. He invites the readers to turn away from their self-centeredness and to recenter on God. But repentance isn't our second R, but rather the act of repentance, that intentional refocusing back to God. And although John spoke with authority and passion, he was also humble. He tells the crowd that he is nothing in comparison to the one who, will act, who is actually the Messiah. For he, the Messiah, will baptise you with Holy Spirit and fire, and he will separate the wheat from the chaff. That fear that fills many Christians through the ages is the reality of John's words that Jesus will sift the wheat from the chaff. The chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. But what does that really mean? And is it as terrifying as it actually sounds? For me personally, I've grown to believe now, different from a child, I believe now that we should not be terrified of Jesus because Jesus is love. He only wants the best for us, and he only wants us to be the best that we can be. However, for this to happen, we do need to take seriously our responsibility, our responsibility to refocus on God, to put our lives back in sync with him. For when we do this, the holy fire of God will purify us. But the fire will not consume us, but rather will remove all that blocks us from that power of God's love. The chaff and the hard tusk that protects the wheat growing will be swept away so that we can show forth that goodness that is at the heart of our very beings. Yes, it might sound scary being purified by God, but it is necessary if we are to do God's will in our lives and in our communities. We need to be resilient in our efforts and our beliefs as Christians. We need to hold on to that hope that Isaiah talks about. We also need to refocus our minds, our thinking, and even our attitude. In order for us to walk on water, we need first to get out of the boat. But then we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, don't we? Because if we don't, we all know what happened to Peter. He sank. As I mentioned earlier, Having lived with the pandemic for almost two years now, we may feel that we're in some kind of exile. Certainties have indeed been stripped away and we are now facing an unknown future. For some of us, there's a need to address the elephant in the room. We need to face the reality by asking the questions of ourselves. Where will our worshipping community be? in five years' time? What will our community worship look like in five years' time? And even, what will Methodism or other denominations look like in five or ten years' time? Just like those Jewish people in exile in Babylon, we too have lost what was familiar to us. We too are being stripped of the bare bones in our places of worship. 
Maybe now is the time for us to turn away from what is familiar, to turn away from our own expectations, our own memories of what life in our churches once was, and accept that reality that things are changing before our very eyes. But also, let us remember those words from Isaiah. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. We might be in a period of exile, a period of uncertainty and change, but God has not given up on us. We are the people of God. We are the church, not the building, us, the gathered and the dispersed community of the church. I'm sure that most of you will be familiar with the words from St. Francis of Assisi, make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, true faith in you. And those words have helped many Christians over the years. They, like the established church, have stood firm for years. So what if they were changed? What if those words were made more relevant to today's world? Well, I found such words this week. And so I'm going to read them to you now. Lord, make me a channel of disturbance. Where there is apathy, let me provoke. Where there is compliance, let me bring questioning. Where there is silence, let me be a voice. Where there is too much comfort and too little action, grant disruption. Where there are doors closed and hearts locked, grant the willingness to listen. Where laws dictate and pain is overlooked, when tradition speaks louder than need, grant that I may seek rather to do justice than just to talk about it. Disturb us, O Lord, to be with as well as for the alienated to love the unlovable as well as the lovely. Lord, make me a channel of disturbance. Wow. So let us be resilient. Let us refocus our thoughts and actions. Let us be bold and ask God to help us to let go of those things that stop us loving God, the things that take all of our energy and time away, so we don't have time for loving others. To take away the things that block our energy, that our energy and our time, so we fail or we're too tired to sit at God's feet and to seek his way in all things. We are living in uncertain times. But whilst we need to acknowledge that, of course we do. But let it not control all of our belief in an awesome and a most powerful God, the one who flung those stars into space, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, the one who has not given up on his church. If we're honest, then it is us, all of us, me included, we've lost our way. We have allowed our need for building, all these rules over governance, and that they block the Holy Spirit. Yes, we need to do things right. But not only churches, small farms and small businesses are struggling under all this governance and all these rules and regulations. We get so caught up in that that we have turned our eyes and our time and our energy away from God. We have misplaced our priorities and so now is the time to turn back to Jesus, to allow the Holy Spirit 
to refine us so that Jesus removes those things that block us from seeing the needs of the world over our perceived understanding of what it means to be church today. How can we be Jesus in the world out there if we believe that being a Christian is only about coming to worship in a building once a week? We gather together today to praise God, to support each other, to be fed so that we can go out and do what we've got to do the rest of the week. We live in uncertain times, but we believe in a God who is faithful and true. God hasn't given up on us yet, and we too need to put our hope and our trust back to him. After all, we are just ordinary people who serve an extraordinary God. It is our calling to spend time with the Father, discerning his will. And through this, we can refocus. We can see afresh what it means to be a Christian today. We can be resilient in seeking out the lost. We can have fresh eyes to see the community through God's eyes. We can be resourced and enabled and equipped to go out into the community and change this world for the better. To feed the poor, to home the homeless, to visit the prisoner, to visit the sick, because it is in those places that others meet Jesus through us. The idea of people coming to us is now outdated. It's an unreal expectation. So let us go to them. Let us make it a priority in our efforts to build God's kingdom here in Kersley and Farmworth. Friday, I was sent a message and we have been asked here at Kearsley Mount to consider helping the charity called Stop Knife Crime in Bolton by installing a bin outside. But we'll chat more about that over coffee. The reason I mention it is, for me personally, it's a no-brainer. I don't even have to think about it. For me, if the church cannot step out of its comfort zone to help reduce needless, needless deaths, then I would have to ask, why are we here? But it isn't just my decision. And like I say, we'll chat more about that over coffee. You see, I believe that God's church is out there. It isn't confined to buildings. And yes, we live in uncertain times, but so have many generations before us, and God has helped them through. In the Acts of the Apostles, the early church didn't have buildings as we do. They were a community of believers who shared everything that they had. They met in house groups to pray and to read and to read that scripture and to ponder together. They realized that those leading worship couldn't do all the community stuff. So they elected Stephen, the first deacon. And to me, that's the real vision of church. We too should be aiming for a church without walls. So this year, let us be resilient in our refocusing of God's priorities. Let us turn to the one who can and wants to resource us so we can be the hands and feet of Jesus out there. This year, let us be agents of change in this ever-changing world. Amen. So we're going to sing now a song that I believe is of God's purpose in our lives. And again, we're going to stand to sing, Heaven shall not wait. Heaven shall not wait for the poor to lose their patience. 
the scorn to smile, the despised to find a friend. Jesus is Lord. He has championed the unwanted. In him, injustice confronts its timely end. to our prayers of intercession. So let us pray. Father God, we pray for the world, torn apart by hatred, broken by dishonesty, and disfigured by cruelty. A world full of suspicion, intolerance, and loathing. Teach us afresh, Lord, how to truly love. We pray for the world, starving because of selfishness, thirsty for clean water, cold for the want of a roof, and dying for a lack of medicine. And in particular, Lord, we bring before you now Brazil and that cliff collapse, and also Nigeria, where hundreds have been needlessly murdered in their villages. Father God, teach us all how to truly love. We pray for the world, wanting to help and not hinder, willing to give and not receive, open to share and not withhold, loving as well as is known, full of goodwill, ideals and sympathy. And so we bring before you now our own church community and we pray for Christina and Ray. 
Harini and Derek, for David and Helen, for Denise and Ronnie, for Edna and all the ladies at Abbeydale nursing her, for Margaret and her family on the loss of her beloved man. Continue to hold before you those who have lost loved ones, and we remember Joanne and Dylan. We pray for John, for Dorothy and for Graham, for Susan, Tom and their family. And in a moment of quiet, I invite you to bring before God maybe your own needs or those of your family and friends who you just want to hold quiet and silent. who loves fully, truly and deeply. Help us to show our love by actions and words so that the world may be united as one and all may live in harmony with equality. In the name of Jesus, who gave himself in love for all mankind. And let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now come to our final hymn in which we will have the offering um, and it's What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Father God, we bring before you now these monetary gifts and our lives, and we ask that your spirit will stir amongst us, that we will use these things to build your kingdom here, to show that unconditional love to all that we meet. Lord Christ, you rule over all. Supreme authority is yours. God has placed all things under your feet. Yet you have called the church to be your body in the world. You want to work through us using our gifts, our skills, our love, transforming them. So gladly, we recommit ourselves and all that we have and are to you. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you and those you love today and every day. Amen.